day with all respect, brother, what ball game this afternoon? Uh, I had hoped there would be a ball game this afternoon, but uh, thankfully it's nothing more than a game. It is good to be together. We'll be in 2 Kings 1, 9 to 12. I did spend some time listening to Max McLean read the uh, NIV yesterday to try to get some of these names right, and I uh, hope I pronounced them correctly, and uh, hopefully so. Had a dear friend a few years ago that did not show up to Bible study one Wednesday night. His mom and dad were there, and I asked them why my friend wasn't there. Come to find out, his wife had been having an affair. She had run off with the boyfriend, and he just couldn't come that night. So I went to my friend's house right after Bible study, and I believe it was one of the saddest sights I've seen in all of my life. He and I sat there for an hour, not a single word was spoken. My friend simply stared off at the TV that was playing. He had zoned out. A couple weeks ago, he was at Bible study, and he caught me in a back room as Bible study was over, and he wailed, wept, grabbed onto me and, and fell to his knees and kept saying, Justin, what am I going to do? What, what, what am I going to do? His friend was able to pick up the pieces and go on and it ended up that he was able to find a nice, sweet lady who also had a right to remarry and they're married and happily so to this day and I'm thankful for that. But his life is never going to be the same because of his wife's sin. It's the case that lives are changed forever because of sin. I'm confident that some of your lives have been forever changed by the sins of others. Maybe someone in your family suffered from addiction and you had pain and Everyone else suffered because of it. Maybe you had a spouse who was unfaithful and your heart shattered in a million pieces. Maybe someone you know had a temper. You had to walk on eggshells to keep from upsetting the apple cart. As much as it is the case that people can harm us through sin, it is also the case that we harm others because of sin. That is simply a reality of life. Others are harmed because of our sin. Think about Adam and Eve. All of their descendants, every single one is harmed because of their sin. Romans 5.15 Many died by the trespass of the one man. One man sinned, and death spread to every single person. Cain killed his brother Abel. Abel suffered because of his brother's sin. 70,000 Israelites died because David numbered the people. People are harmed by our sins. We can't pretend that sin is just a little oopsie doopsie or it's not that big a deal or that everything's okay, that it doesn't really matter. Because sin harms others. This morning we're not going to think about how sin harms we ourselves, but rather we want to think about how sin harms others. And we're going to think about Isaiah and how Isaiah's sin harmed 
others. Uzziah fell from his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. He was badly injured. He was in bed. He could not walk. He, he was a very injured man. You know, as I read this narrative, one thing that strikes me and, and stands out is, you know, today you fall from what was probably a second story, you know, you fall off the lattice there. You go to the hospital and more than likely you're going to be okay. It's going to be perhaps long rehab or something, but you're going to be okay. Not then, of course. Isaiah is gravely injured. He sent messengers to Beelzebub, pagan god, to ask him, this pagan god, if he would recover or not. Beelzebub was known for divination, Susain, so he sent folks to him. Here he is, the king of Israel, but he sends messengers to a pagan god to see what that god has to say. The word of the Lord came to Elijah and told Elijah to go and to intercept these messengers and tell them that Zara would not recover, that Zario is going to die. They went back very quickly to the king and report to him the words of Elijah. The king's shocked that the people come back so quickly, these messengers. And so when they tell him about Isaiah's or Elijah's prophecy, he asked them uh, who had sent them. They did not know his name, but they described Elijah. And so Isaiah hatches a plot to get things reversed. And he teaches us this vital lesson. Your sin destroys others. Notice the text doesn't say that your sin harms others. It hurts others. That you should not do it, but rather your sin destroys others. Sin in our text this morning destroys others people, destroys them. And as we play with sin in our lives, it will destroy others. Notice what we read. 1 Kings chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Then he, King Isaiah, sent to Elijah a captain with his company of 50 men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, Come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Now, remember, the Isaiah is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. But he still knew that Elijah spoke the word of God. Think about that for a moment. He knew that what Elijah had said was going to happen. And thus he sends messengers, he sends a captain and 50 men to arrest Elijah. That's likely why they went. That They weren't going to say, hi Elijah, how you doing today? They're going to arrest him. And notice this. Isaiah thinks that by arresting Elijah, he can cause Elijah, convince him perhaps, force him, to change the prophecy. Isaiah neglected to understand something. Look back at verse 4. Therefore, Elijah is speaking, this is what the Lord said. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. 
wasn't what Elijah thought. Wasn't what Elijah wanted. Was not the word of Elijah. It was the word of God. Spoke the word of God. It didn't matter if Isaiah arrested him or not. That word was not going to change. However, the captain and his 50 men go to Elijah sitting on a hill. It's possible that Elijah is sitting on that Carmel where he had had the contest with the prophets of Baal. You understand the word of God often came from the mountain. Goes up the mountain, receives the law of God. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount from a mountain. And thus mountains are places of divine revelation. Here's Elijah, a prophet, sitting on a hill when the men come to him. And the captain says, man of God, the king says, come down. Not you know, the king has some questions he'd like to talk to you about. The king's wondering if you all can talk about the word of the Lord, help him understand it better. But the king says, come down. An order from the king. Here's a man who's used to getting his way. He is the king. He has these palace lackeys all around him. He sends them to a pagan god to get answers. When they come back with the word of the Lord rather than the word of Beelzebub, they, he sends the men to arrest Elijah. He is a pure narcissist. I mean, Isaiah is number one on that list of narcissists. He thinks he can order God around and get his own way. Come down. Elijah answered the captain, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Elijah was a man of God. The fire did fall from heaven and consume the captain and his 50 men. At this, verse 11, the king sent to Elijah another captain with his 50 men. The captain said to him, man of God, this is what the king says. Come down at once. Do it now. There is a veil threat there. If I am man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him, his 50 men. Uzziah is a slow man to learn his lesson. He sends a captain and 50 men to Elijah, says, bring him back to me. Fire comes from heaven, consumes them. So Uzziah, for some reason or other, thought it was a good idea to send another captain, 50 men. Fire comes from heaven and consumes them. And guess what? Isaiah ain't done yet. He sends another captain and 50 men to Elijah to, to, to arrest him again. Here's a man who has no regard for others, who has not learned his lesson, but who is bound and determined to get his way. And as he does that, he causes men to sin. Think about that. He's causing these men to sin. He sends them to a pagan god, first of all. When that doesn't pan out, he sends them to arrest a prophet. And then they die. The cause of the word of Isaiah, the king. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. And he gets people killed. He 
See, your sin destroys others. Isaiah's sin destroyed the souls of men. Your sins very well can destroy the souls of men. That is what Jesus said. Matthew 18, 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me, to stumble. It would be better for them that a large millstone be hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Think about that. Jesus says, if you're going to call someone to stumble, if you're going to call someone to lose faith, it's better to have a millstone hung around your neck, be drowned in the depth of the sea. Why, Lord Jesus? Because your sin destroys others. Paul thought the same thing. Romans 14, 15. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Don't use your liberty to eat food sacrificed to idols. That's the context. Don't use your liberty to eat that food. It's okay to eat. If you're going to call somebody else to stumble, and notice what the text says, destroy them. Lead them into sin by violating their conscience and cause them to be destroyed, to end up losing your soul. Because your sin destroys others, you need a proper sense of self. A proper sense of self. That's what Isaiah is like. This man who cares about nobody, no thing, nothing but the king. That's it. He's used to getting his way. He wants his way. When the word of the pagan god doesn't come to pass, he sends 153 men to arrest Elijah and puts them in jeopardy. 102 of them die. Think about this. Four times. Four times. In just these four verses, these few verses, Isaiah causes men to sin. He sends them to pagan gods. And three times, three times, he sent captain and their 50 men to arrest Elijah. Why? Because he was arrogant. Because of his hubris. Because he thought he had everything together. Because he is the king. Because he is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. Because he has power. If you want to keep from destroying others, you have to get outside of yourself. And quit caring only about yourself. I hate to break it to you, but life ain't all about you. It's not all about you. It wasn't all about Isaiah. Newsflash for him. He learned the lesson too late. Put others in harm's way. Calls them to sin because of his arrogance. Because he did not have a proper sense. If we do not want to destroy others, we have to have that proper care of self. Romans 12, 3. By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't think you're something when you're not. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you looking to the interest of the others. Proper sense of self. Caring about others. In humility, regarding them as better than yourself. Do yourself a favor. Think back over the last week. Think about the way you interact with people. Work, school, wherever, home. How would a proper sense of self have changed the way you interacted? How would remembering it's not all about you have impacted the way you acted? How would regarding others better than yourself change the way you act? How could you have kept from sin, perhaps leading others to sin, if you had that proper sense of self? And also, if you do not want to destroy others, you must have a proper sense of Scripture. Proper sense of Scripture. Isaiah demonstrated a total disregard, lack of respect for the Word of God. In the first place, he sends some messengers to a pagan god, Beelzebub, to ask whether he'll live or die. And then when that doesn't turn out the way that he wants, he sends men to arrest Elijah and to get the prophet to change the prophecy. And you understand why Isaiah failed when he disregarded the word of God. Because what God says, Scripture, is not the opinion of Paul or John or Matthew or Elijah or anybody else. Rather, it is the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.13 This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Not in words taught by human wisdom. Not in words taught by any man but in words taught by the Spirit. The very words of Scripture are inspired to God. The very words. Not just the ideas, concepts, and so forth, but the words themselves are inspired. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 We also thank God continually because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Accepted it as it really is, the word of God. And because Scripture is the work, the Word of God, Scripture makes you complete for every, every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is God free and is useful for teaching. Right? 
may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. With Scripture, I lack nothing. But rather, I am equipped for every good work. I have everything I need. Because Scripture is inspired of God. Again, think back over this week. If you had a proper view of Scripture, how might your life have been different? If you had paid attention to what God said and the way you interacted with others, how would you have lived different? If you read Scripture and put it in your heart, what sins might you have stayed away from? If you paid attention to Scripture, what would you not have done that you did? What would you have done that you did not? How would Scripture really have impacted your life this past week? Did it impact your life? Could it have impacted your life more? How is your life shaped by that living, abiding Word of God? Really and truly. That your sin destroys others. How would your life be different? If you understood that by sinning you destroy others, how would your life be different? What sin in your life would you get rid of? What sin in your life is destroying others would you get rid of? How would you live in the home if you were cognizant of the fact that how you acted could destroy those around you? How would you live at work if you remembered that the way you act could destroy your co-workers? What sin would you get rid of? What great what scripture would you memorize to have handy in time of need? How much more time might you spend in prayer? How would your life be different if you really understood? Sin destroys not just yourself, but destroys others. Is there sin in your life this morning that's destroying you? Is there guilt beating you up? Is the case that you need to ask for a prayer as a child of God to strengthen? For forgiveness, for courage? Do you need to come as one who's never put on Jesus in baptism and be immersed to have your sins forgiven? If you need to come this morning, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?